So if, if all these people have had an influence on you, out of everything you've done in terms of your scholarly works, your books and your articles and your centers, what do you think has had the greatest influence on others? What do you see as your most accomplished or most impactful work? Yeah, that's funny because various people have, have talked to me about that, and including Betty Greenfield. And I think that the I think that the most important general influence has been <clears throat> to get away from the idea that behavior is somehow to be chopped out of its context, that it always has to be looked at contextually. Mm. That our conversation now is in the context of your interviewing me. Uh, we would go off on all kinds of crazy jokey kinds of things, although there have been several occasions where we couldn't <laughs> quite resist anyway. But, uh, and um, this context boundedness and wh what forms context? It's culture. That's why I say that to be, to be an adequate human being, to some extent, you've got to be a little bit of an anthropologist. Sure. And reduce ma reductionism? Ma ma no ma non troppo, is it? but not too much. <laughs> <laughs> Not too much. What about reductionism? So you started at Duke looking at how you put things in boxes and categories. How do you feel about reductionism now? Hate it. Hate it. Yeah. Reject it 100%. No, not 100%. I mean, there, there are times when, it, uh, let, me, let me say, uh, reductionism is compared to premature reduction. I mean, do I have any objection to the sure. fact that physics was able to make a good mathematical account, give a good mathematical account? Or, that had consequences is you have to use some formalism in between and that's one of the great powers of the human mind that it's able to build a symbol system and make deductions from the symbol system and then try it out of the world and then say some deep thing like Jesus Christ that really works <laughs> it's really true yeah 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 looking back at your career if you were to start over would you do anything differently as if I'm in any position to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Would I do anything differently? No, because those, I mean, it's, it's a funny kind of meaningless question because the fact of the matter is that you did, you know, what opportunities there were at the time. Uh, should, should, should I go back to that conversation on the back lawn at that lovely house of Professor McDougall's when he, that the two, the two universities you should bear in mind, one of them is Yale, the other one is Harvard. And he, he was a little bit negative on Harvard because he said it's a terrible snob place, which isn't completely true. I mean, every, every university is a snob place. <coughs> but should I have gone to Yale? No. I think, well, but, but on the other hand, I'm very struck by all of my Yale faculty friends. I have more of a intimate time with their colleagues and other places. But on the other hand, uh, they're bored to tears. They keep coming to New York. Why do they come to New York? Why can't I? What, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you ever spent any time in New Haven? No. You're a lucky girl. Oh. <laughs> I mean, <it's> a, <laughs> a boring place. <laughs> yeah. You are one of the esteemed 50 modern thinkers on education. Your chapter was written by Howard Gardner. Your book, The Process of Education, was praised as seminal, revolutionary, and a classic, and it dominated the Harvard University Press bestsellers list for many years. And you have earned honorary degrees from Yale, Columbia, Sorbonne in Paris, Berlin, Rome, and many others. In 2002, you received your honorary doctorate in Crete. You know what I'm going to yes, say. Yes, yes. Your no. friend Giannis recalls when you he and many others drank Rocky, and instead of drinking black coffee to sober up, continued to drink Rocky and smoke borrowed cigarettes. <laughs> you were then. Did Jonas say that to he you? He did. You were then 87. What is your secret to living such a long life? I had. To, it must be God or biology secret. I. I, I, I um, Drinking and smoking cigarettes isn't part of that? I don't smoke cigarettes. I smoke a pipe. Um, <laughs> you smoke a pipe. Yeah. And well, I used to smoke cigarettes, but I haven't smoked cigarettes in 10 Since years. Since 1987? Yeah. 
Or 2002. 2002. When you were with Giannis and you were <laughs> borrowing his cigarettes. Oh, maybe it's because of the fact that I ran out of tobacco. Oh, well, I didn't, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I did borrow some cigarettes. I find it, it's, very, it's a very funny kind of thing. When you're with people having a conversation and they're smoking cigarettes, you want a cigarette. <laughs> it isn't the cigarette, it's the, it's the I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> what you can do with it. <laughs> yeah, holding it in your hand and pointing it at the cigarette. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Howard Gardner recalls that you have always been extremely youthful, athletic, with features of a much younger person. He adds that while you may be 96, you are very youthful, the youngest and most eager child still in the class. <laughs> I would say that. <laughs> Jose Lanasa adds that you have a strong and well-fit body to support your active mind. Who, who said this? Jose Lanasa. Oh, hello, so young. And underneath such a brilliant intelligence, there is a warm and sympathetic hearth that makes you a wonderful human being. You also served... I know, look at that. You also <laughs> served as the president of the American Educational Research Association in 1965. You have published countless articles and books, and you have received countless awards for your scholarship in developmental psychology and your contributions to our understanding of the human condition. You have also mentored a laundry list of major figures in psychology. So many of your graduate students have gone to become major, 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 figures, major, major yeah. figures in psychology and, and other social sciences. And none of them have become stuffed shirts. I'm and very that, proud of that. That's, yes. that is, you mm. should be proud of that. Mm. Some of whom remain your mentees to this day. Some of whom responded here. So what's next? What haven't you accomplished that you still want to achieve? I would have to say that I still would like to have a better understanding of the arts, of why the need for the creation of beauty, um, beauty with power, that is to say, beauty that penetrates. Mm. Um, it's been something that has fascinated me ever since I was mentioning my brother Adolf taking me to the museum the Metropolitan Museum of Art when I was eight or nine or ten for the first time. And I still remember that, that, that first visit, seeing some of the paintings of Hieronymus Bosch and saying to myself, my God, I've never seen that part of people. And what I would like, to, what I would like, to, I'd like to accomplish, and I think this is still one of the great mysteries, how it is that, um, how it is, for example, that a really gifted artist could do five pictures of you. One of them which is saying, oh, good. that looks just like Audrey. Another one that makes you look like a strumpet. Another one that makes you look like a saint. How in the hell, what do we do to do that mm. in the arts? Or a landscape and that kind of thing like that. I'm taken, for example, with the capacity of a Van Gogh, for example, had the capacity to come into a scene and to paint it and give it a, a kind of a meaning. So what, what does art do? And this has kept me going for a long time. And it also has been for me, I think, one of the nutriments that's fed my curiosity about other aspects of psychology. That um, we're in an organism that has this capacity Well, the capacity, for example, that this little gang that got this place from, <laughs> from <laughs> those Japanese girls who were painting the thing like that after it had been nearly a century old, and turned it into this lovely mm. kind of place which everybody went and said, well, wow, wow, where did you get, you know, that little courtyard you walked in on? Here in your home? Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, used to be, they used to be a second, they used to be a second hand store. Mm. that space. Mm. They took it out, something like that. And uh, the, the business of turning things into beauty, that what, what, for example, makes New York not only a powerhouse of a city, but I still have the feeling when I'm in a cab coming down Fifth Avenue in that last 20 or so blocks before you come to Washington, the Washington Monument, Washington Square. Um, how does it, how did a city grow to this kind of beauty. Mm. And you know, we don't know beans about that. Mm -mm. 
Yeah, we know people who can do it. We say, hey, you. Uh, we know, how, yeah. Yeah. You know, and we know, and we know something about how to educate them, but that itself is kind of interesting. Um, because I was last last evening, for example, I was invited to come to a class over at the Steinhardt School at NYU that is run by a very interesting lady by the name of Susan Koff. And it's a class where they're teaching ballet dancers how to be ballet teachers. Mm. And you watch them come forth with an idea about how to give somebody a sense of move and then go through the dance movement itself. Uh, and there was one China, young Chinese man, maybe getting on to be 30-ish or something of the sort, and I said, I was sitting next to Sue, he came and did a little pas de deux kind of thing like that. I said, where in the hell did a guy in your class learn to dance like that? I mean, she said, oh, he worked for four years in the ballet company in Shanghai, mm -hmm. <laughs> things like that. So how do they, how do they, so that's, that's the area of the arts and all the, all, all of the arts is we can turn, we can turn the ordinary into the art, the, the, the possible art like that. Everything, including interpersonal relations, is an art form. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have, I don't, one of the things that I've always taken seriously is keeping my, keeping my, particularly my doctoral students and so on like that from losing the artistry of their approach. They feel that it should become, as we say in Italian, molto serioso, they're very, very serious about the thing. I thought, take it easy. And uh, so, so there you are, yeah, the arts. The arts, that's, yeah. that's your next goal. Well, that's, that's, that's next on the list. Well, it's next on the list, but I've been, I've been working unsuccessfully. <laughs> <laughs> For decades. <laughs> so, I, so finishing it is on the list. <laughs> okay, what inspires you? I haven't a clue. What inspires what me? What inspires you? Well, a, very, a million things inspire me, but one of the things that inspires me is exchange and conversation, mm. finding a meeting of the minds. I find that so fascinating. It's the task of the novelist, the task of the poet, the task of our conversation today. Mm. How, how do we achieve it? It's amazing. I mean, how in the hell did God or evolution ever design a species that can do this kind of thing? Mm. It's amazing. Um, this again, yeah. So that inspires, that's one of the reasons why I've gone at communication. That was from the first, I mean, I remember some of the first times I did a whole string of studies using the, you know what a tachistoscope is? Mm -mm. A tachistoscope is a very highbrow piece of apparatus that flashes at a fixed light, on, off light, pictures or anything else, a display. And you get your subject to report what they've seen as you increase mm. the exposure. Uh, Published at least a dozen studies using a tachistoscope. I got the electrical engineering department at MIT to design, to design one for me. <laughs> I used to be so annoyed. It got to be called the Brunner tachistoscope, and I said it should be called the MIT tachistoscope. <laughs> but um, in there, it's so interesting because the fact of the matter is that the world that you see has to do with what you expect to happen. That is to say, I can show you, I show you a display that if you were expecting something of that category of display, you would get in a thousandth of a second. Mm. If you're expecting something else, it will take you 30 thousandths of a second, 30 times as long to get into your big thick head, you know, and you sit there like that. And so what is this business of readiness? I, d I developed then something which a lot of my centimeter seconds physicalistic psychology and dislike, which is the hypothesis theory of perception, that is to say, perception dependent upon the working hypothesis that was present. And it's that it's that that 
goes back to my interest in the question of the arts. The arts somehow break your conventional hypotheses. Um, And I'll tell you an interesting story about this, the way in which it comes into effect. This has to do with the great physicist Niels Bohr, the Nobel laureate, who is much older than we are. We were talking about, the, he wanted very much to know about what the, what the devil was going on in psychology, and I told him about the battle between the, between the behaviorists and the cognitivists and so on like that. And he said, it's interesting, it reminds me of the fact that there are different ways of seeing the world. I'll tell you a story. My son Uga, who also turned out to be a great physicist and a Nobel laureate also, came home one day, the next morning, he came to me and he showed me a toy, a new toy. This is my new toy, Daddy. So I said to him, where did you get it, Uga? And he said, I was in the five and ten, and I saw it, and I took it and I put it in my pocket. Mm. And then Bohr turned to me and said, so how should I now know my, how should I now then know my son in the light of love or in the light of justice? Mm. And it's that kind of thing which I think is so critical. Mm. And to get my goddamn psychological colleagues to pay more attention to this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of the things. We, so I've got that string of people that you read off. Yeah. They're kind of some of the leading figures in the world today. They are. So yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. Pretty hot shot gang. What do you find, you said what you found inspiring. What do you find uninspiring? Uninspiring. What do you mean by uninspiring? What does not move you? What do you, what annoys you? Oh, annoys me, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, what I'll call persistent banality. Okay. When <laughs> 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 he goes on saying something that's so banal and so baloney, you know, like that. And I said, and, you, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm a rather well brought up kid. I don't have it in me quite to say, will you please shut up? <laughs> <laughs> Persistent banality. <laughs> Have you coined that term anywhere in your writings? No, I coined it right now. Coined it right now. We're <laughs> yeah. going to copyright that. Okay. <laughs> Persistent banality. Yeah. What is your favorite word besides that one? Favorite word? I don't think I have a favorite word. Um, I don't have favorite, I have favorite put together words. Okay. That's a very interesting kind of thing. And I have a very good poetry memory so that, for example, I can take, I can recite through all 10 pages of Eliot's love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Let me not into the marriage of true minds admit impediment. Love is not love which alters when the alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. It is an ever fixed mark, dot, 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 on like that. Um, and um, so what was the, how did you put the question? What's your favorite word is that you can. So it, it, it's the business of bringing, um, um, there's a, com a combination of Economy. I mean, um, at the, toward the very end of Prufrock, for example, Eliot says, "If this be error, and upon me proved, I never writ nor no man ever loved." Hmm. And th that combination of words makes you think, "Ooh, that's that's interesting." That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's the best of times. It's the worst of times. <laughs> yes, that would be another right. one. That's it's right, just yeah. phenomenal putting those yeah. words together. That's right. Yeah. Okay. What is your favorite curse word? What favorite what? Curse word. I don't use curse words. You don't? No. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, do I ever use curse words? When you stub your toe, what do you say? Damn. Damn. 
Yeah. Okay, <laughs> there we go. We'll take it. Well, you take that. All right. What profession other than your own would you have liked to attempt? Would I have liked to attempt it? Yeah. Well, I have attempted another one, the law. Ah. But I'm not a practicing lawyer. Sure. And I have to tell you a funny thing. John Sexton, who is now our president of the university, used to be dean of the law school. Um, I said to him, John, somebody was saying to me the other day, I want to go take the bar exam. And John looked at me and said, Jerry, I'll break your goddamn neck if you take the bar exam. <laughs> You're so much more valuable to us as a non-lawyer <laughs> than, <laughs> than as a lawyer. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> what profession other than your, your own would you not have liked to attempt? Become a, becoming a businessman, investor, that kind of thing like that. Sure. No, that's not for me. I don't like that. What is your favorite movie? I don't go to the movies that much often, but what is what was my favorite movie? Um, we well, used to love those Marilyn Monroe movies. Oh, you remember that? Sure. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. I'll take those. Take yeah. those. Yeah. What about your favorite book? That changes from time to time. I've been very different ones. Yeah. <clears throat> there was one time. Um, When any any novel of Thomas Mann was the greatest book in the world, <laughs> I went through the novel. Mm. I think I went through Mann's novels maybe twice. But then, um, what's the big thick one of Dostoevsky? Um, then I also went through a period when I thought Sinclair Lewis was the great narrator of the American scene. I don't have a favorite book. Yeah. Um, but and yet, and yet, and yet, and yet, um, some of Freud's early naive writing I like very much. Mm. I like it very much because I like the daring of it. And he didn't have enough proof to stick in your eye. But he went his way, took mm. his gamble. Mm. And he changed our way of looking at the nature of man. Mm. Not that we are Freudians, but made us think, what do we think, huh? Mm. Yeah. Sure. If you could tell President Obama one thing, what would it be? To stick to his guns, for Christ's sake, and not give in to those goddamn Republicans who came. <laughs> 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 what would okay? you really want to say? Yes, that's perfect. <laughs> if you could have dinner with anybody dead or alive, who would it be and why? Dinner with anybody dead or alive? Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Oh, I'd want to think about that because I keep thinking of people, and I say, "Yeah, I would really love to have dinner with them." <laughs> so I can't think. <laughs> I can't think of one. Yeah. Uh, huh. Who would I like to have dinner with? I think about that. <clears throat> I can't answer that. I can't answer that because I, I don't think of the, you know, no. Okay. No. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think I'd like to hear him say, uh, there's a gang here that's been having a very interesting time. And I think they'd be very much interested in having you join them. Oh. Yeah. You know, Great. Yeah. Maybe for dinner. So you just answered <laughs> both questions. <laughs> okay. What advice would you offer to graduate students and beginning researchers who hope to make a contribution to psychology or education? <clears throat> to look good and close at how things go in life and not 
narrowing it down into a little bit of a laboratory or questionnaire kind of thing. But for God's sakes, to look at life, take a look and brood about what aspect of it you want to study. Don't just go ahead and follow some damn bird track, okay. which is what most of our graduate schools are doing now, handing them good bird tracks with big statistical means for showing that you're in or out of the bird track. Yeah. That's nice. I like that. Okay. When asked to capture the essence and nature of Jerome Bruner, three themes emerged. You are a visionary. Andreas Morty notes that your ability to find exceptional in the normality is your greatest talent. Andrew Metzoff notes you can see the future and you've helped create it. You are able to see around corners and predict the future before anybody else. Howard Gardner agrees, calling you the Moses in many fields of study. You see the field first, you make the initial profound statement of problems and methods, give the work a good start in the right direction. And then fix up all the black and blue marks and that my colleagues are giving <laughs> Like Moses, you are also content to leave it to others, especially your students, to explore the promised land That's in what greater students detail. Are for, you That's idiot. What students are for. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, you are a great mentor and teacher. Colwyn Trevarthan notes, the scope of your psychology is vast, but your principles are simple and clear because you love life and people, and you love teaching. Jose Lanaza says that above all else, you are a creative artist in the way you have shaped your life and the lives of those who have had the privilege of being close to you, especially your students. I'm feeling very... Alice. Flattered at the moment. I, I, I love this. Allison Gopnik agrees. Your most noteworthy accomplishment is that you have mentored generations of students who again went on to make substantial and entirely original contributions on their own with your support. You never had disciples. You are most brilliant. Howard Gardner describes you as one of the most forefront educational thinkers of the air, stating that you really have no peers. That's a nice one. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I like that one. Michael Cole and Giannis agree. Giannis likening you to Sigmund Freud, Jean Piaget, and Lev Vygotsky. In the end, Andrew Meltsoff captures you as follows. Curious, creative, interested, and interesting. A mentor without match. A one mentor who, without what? A mentor without match. One who relishes the life of the mind and the hand. A thinker as well as a doer. A social being who continues to find energy and joy in the ideas of others. And one who is passionate about ideas and the inexhaustible pursuit of new discoveries. One who is optimistic about human potential and someone who found wisdom far before old age yet held on to youthful enthusiasm long after you were young. You're one of the greatest thinkers about human nature and culture to have graced intellectual history. I should have her come once a week. I know. <laughs> I'm telling you, this was inspiring to hear every, what everybody had to say about you. And you have graced us. You would be at home in the fresco by Renaissance artist Raphael, the School of Athens. Oh, and that's you would so relish nice. the oh, conversation. That's, lovely. <laughs> that's, like, that's just like your answer to the, the Golden Gates. Yeah. You, you predicted that one. Well, there is no doubt you have graced us all today and throughout your academic history and past, and we, over time, are bound to relish this conversation for everything you have done for us, for future educationists, educational researchers, and everyone else you have intellectually touched and inspired yourself. Gianna still has the glass that held your Rocky from that, <laughs> that night. It has the glass that does what? The, the Rocky that you drank that one night with Giannis. <laughs> The small one that you took from the restaurant filled to the rim. <laughs> so as we are here, we lift our glasses of Rocky and give cheers to you, our esteemed and beloved Jerry Bruner. Cheers. <laughs> cheers to you. Thank, Thank you, you for having us for the interview. It was fun. And yeah. Entertaining. Yes, it was very was insightful nice, yeah. and inspiring. Yeah. Well, that was very, very nice. I mean, um, is anything, anything left out uh, <clears throat> that I should add to that? Not that I can think of. Um, none of them, none of them, recognized anything. My need for the bodily. 
um, that I was successively, in spite of my presumed bad vision, which isn't bad, squash, tennis, mm. rowing, sailing, like that. I have needed, I have needed the counteractive automaticity of the body. Uh, I think the body is tremendously important. Uh, keep you going. But then there's one other thing you left out. You talked about all of these, all of these ladies in my life. Who, who, who are these ladies in my life? Just the ladies that were following you around Oxford, I suppose. The ladies who were what? Following you around Oxford, Oxford when you were there. Oh, yeah. Did I, did I know most of them? Let's see, Andrew Meltzoff. Wherever you went, you always seemed to have beautiful women in tow. In tow? In tow. I think they you were just... You not only attracted I, I think, the I, most beautiful, but also the smartest women. It was well known that if you wanted to go to run into the most attractive and intellectually interesting females, you better go find Jerry Bruner. For God's sakes, really? <laughs> 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 I, I, I'm glad. I'm glad to know I had that reputation. Yes, I, I know. know. <laughs> I would love. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty nifty. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you are.